Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Ariel Sorenzi, and we're going to be talking about things that suck in myopia management. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Cade. Thank you again for joining us for the uh, Myopia Podcast. I'm excited to be with my friend, Ariel Sorenzi. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we um, have had Ariel on the, on the show before, but it is uh, exciting to talk with you again. Um, tell us a little bit about your practice, what you do is in the world of specialty, and then uh, we'll dive into uh, some t- conversation here. Great. So I am in a a private practice in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, after completing my residency in cornea and contact lens, I knew that I wanted to do a lot of specialty contact lenses. So that is, you know, sclerals, RGPs, orthokeratology, and and myopia management. So I get to, I'd say probably 20 to 30% of my day now is specialty contact lenses. And I love that so much. I love to have, you know, a mix of nice, normal routine eye care with, uh, you know, sometimes some of the crazies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's not all wine and roses, right? Uh, specialty uh, practices, myopia management comes with its fair share of negative. And we focus a lot on the myopia podcast on uh, ways to be more successful. What are the really good things about myopia management? And beings that you're such a positive person, I thought we could talk with you about the negatives of myopia, uh, myopia management, whether it's a conversation, whether it's the effectiveness of a treatment. What are you seeing as some of the things that just suck about myopia management? Yeah, that is that is something I think is, is so important to, to discuss because when you go to these presentations, you know, myself included, I talk about how amazing this technology is. We're going to be changing these people's lives, uh, the projection of their vision. Um, but it does come with a lot of challenges. So one in particular is, you know, typically the parents that really understand myopia management and are motivated to get their children in myopia management tend to be pretty intense. Um, if I, if I open my email for the day, you can almost guarantee that I'll have a parent in there that has bullet points of a million different questions about their child and myopia management. Mm -hmm. I see you smiling and you probably have the same thing. (laughs) Would you say that you see that a lot as well? Absolutely. What are some things that you hear from them that are common questions among those, those parents? Oh gosh, it's all over the place. You know, um, you know, my child's eye is red. Do we need to come in immediately? Can we, can we be seen, you know, right now it's seven o'clock on a Friday. (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, she's saying that our vision is blurry. Could this be progression? Do we need to come in? Um, it's gosh, it's just, they're very, it seems like they're very, they have a very deep understanding of what you're doing. And so they're usually great questions, but they tend to be pretty intense and kind of have a high anxiety tone behind them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of feed into that, right? We charge them a lot of money. And so they expect uh, a lot of service out of us for it, right? Right. Right. And rightfully yeah. so. That's why we charge what we charge, because you know how much extra time those those patients are going to take. Mm-hmm. And we're charging it because it's a value, but also we're providing a service value. And I think that's an important thing for us to keep in mind is, but why do you charge so much for myopia management? Your cost of lenses is less than that. So what what are you really charging for? And it's the, it's the, the service, right? It's the, the Mm -hmm. extra visits that we might have to do. Uh, You you know, we had a, a great conversation with uh, Dr. Chapman about uh, charging per visit or charging a global fee. And there's great advantages to both. But if you're charging a global fee, you might see some patients more often than others. 
Uh, have, when was the last time you went back and evaluated how many times a year you see your myopia management patients? Have you had a chance to do that? I haven't. And it's definitely something that I should look into and really compare it to, you know, our chair cost and what we're charging to see if it makes sense. So I really mm-hmm. do. Think I need to audit myself and, and check that. Yeah. But I mean, if you think about a normal routine orthokeratology patient that everything goes perfectly, yeah. you see them the one day, one week, one month, six months. And if you're having to do lens changes, you all of a sudden go from four or five visits to maybe, you know, eight or nine. Yeah, it could, bed, be. You know? could be. Could <laughs> be. Yeah, it, it, you know, and, and, and it's somewhat hard to always track those sort of things. One, one of the things that we added in two and a half years ago, I know because I can run the report in my electronic record system, is we have added a service in our electronic record system that's no charge myopia management visit. And so if you okay. come in and you're coming for a follow-up, I can always run a report to find out how many of those no charge myopia management visits that we do to find out like, what does this really go to? And then I can compare it to the number of fittings that I do and find out what that is. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good way to kind of track that. And ours is a little over uh, two. It's, it's about two and a half to three. We evaluate that. And the importance of evaluating that is to look at, uh, you know, what our cost and our chair cost is, just like you said. Because if it's too high, then what is, is it really worth it for us to do myopia management the way that we do it? And I think one of the other big things that that changed for us, and you hit on it, is I used to really target uh, vision with orthokeratology, soft mm-hmm. multifocals, and the importance of getting that patient to have perfect vision. And we know with myopia management, we're trying to slow the progression of myopia, not enhance the clarity of the vision. In fact, we know from some studies that when a patient has higher order aberrations, we may slow down the progression even more. So we right. may want to be inducing some of that and they may still be able to see 2020, 2025, but it may not be as good. And if you can't get that across to the parent, they're going to be emailing you, right? Right. And that's something that I learned from you um, in one of your podcasts. And I love that because we always talk about vision and that 2020 vision. And actually today, the reason why I was a little bit late to our meeting today was I had a patient that came in because at their visit with their pediatrician, they weren't a perfect 2020 on the, mm. their VA check. And um, I started orthokeratology with them three years ago before I learned your amazing trick. <laughs> um, and it's just, I think that's so important to talk about. And I love that that um, you mentioned mentioned that previously and are mentioning it again because it, it really is so important. Yeah. Well, we had Randy Kojima and Pat Caroline on the podcast before, and I was listening to them speak at the Academy of Optometry, and, and they were talking about how when we get ready to give a lecture, we always go and look for the perfect topographies of the perfect fitting patient. And yeah. when you get that patient, you cancel all the patients for the afternoon so you can take pictures and get the perfect <laughs> picture for your lecture. And then we we get up there and we're like, hey, we do myopia management and this is how great it is and this is how perfect it is. And here's examples of how, I'm, how my fits look perfect. Yeah, the reality is they don't, right? <laughs> they don't. I do. They, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yours too, right. Um And, uh, you know, you you sometimes just don't have that perfect fit. And uh, the the strategy and the objective here is to slow down the progression of myopia. We know that in 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 the atropine world, and we're realizing more and more that an increase in spherical aberration, and we believe that maybe even in coma, uh, which is actually a decentered lens, could slow the progression more. Now, I don't advocate for bad fits, (laughs) right? Right. Uh, But that's an educational standpoint that we want to hit on. So thank you. What are some of the other things that patients are uh, complaining about or that you find to be a pain in the butt when it comes to myopia management? Yeah. Um, You know, vision is is definitely one of those things that uh, we have to, you know, change, change the way that we present it in the beginning. Um, You know, I think the probably the most challenging part of 
doing myopia management is that initial visit that you have with patients where you're introducing this topic mm-hmm. to them. And I, I made a vow to myself that if I have a patient that is, you know, a young myopic patient, I'm talking about it every time. I don't care mm-hmm. if you're behind, whatever, like you owe it to this patient be a standard of care to have this discussion. But honestly, sometimes I dread it because it is kind of an uphill battle or it is an uphill battle. You're one explaining them something to them that they've probably never heard of before. And then you're like, oh, by the way, this is the cost instead of the cost that you are expecting to pay for your routine routine visit and, and eyewear. Yeah. And it, you know, we all hate to be told no, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of part of our psyche, I guess. And yeah. that's, um, that's probably the biggest, the biggest challenge is yeah. getting those new patients. What do, what do you no. think? I think new patients are really challenging. And, you know, fortunately, many, many of my patients are either referred in or have seen one of the other doctors in our offices. And so what, uh, what we've kind of done is just like a glaucoma patient is we bring up the problem but rarely discuss the solution at the initial visit. We're going to need to do some additional testing. We're going to see you back. We're going to look further into this Mm -hmm. because an eye exam is intended to be just that. Here's what your vision is. Here's what your glasses prescription is. And I think the key message here, and we actually have this written on my whiteboard right here in my office, is how we talk to our patients is what are the things that you're concerned about? And using the words, this is concerning to me Mm -hmm. and saying to a parent, this prescription is advancing. This is concerning to me because if it keeps going, they won't be able to function as well without glasses or contact lenses. And the higher the risks for disease as time goes on, I want to bring you back and do an evaluation a little bit more closely as to what's going on here and talk to you about some additional solutions. Now they're going to have a couple of questions, but that's always where we defer those questions to later, right? And as best as you can within a reasonable, but it is so hard because it's completely foreign in that first conversations. And I find that trying to cram it all in, Mm -hmm. I hate it. And like you, it makes it so difficult. So the vast majority of the time, bringing them back for a myopia consultation, bringing them back for a glaucoma consultation, a dry eye consultation is, is taking away from that eye exam and getting that additional visit for them if possible. Yeah. And you're, and you're definitely not as effective when you're trying to explain it all in one, but you have to be effective enough that they see the value in, in coming back. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it's ultimately up to them and you're right, but that makes it more challenging, which is why I think a lot of people don't delve into myopia management right away. Right. It it makes it a lot harder. I think one of the other things is that, that I think about myopia management, that it really sucks is that you don't do well in myopia management unless you dive in with both feet. And uh, why I say that is because if you're running between eye exams and medical office visits and you're doing everything and you're rushed, you kind of don't get into a flow of how to say what to say. And your natural tendency is to go to easy, which is here's the change to your prescription and glasses. Let's see next year if it progresses again. Right. We we actually know what's going to happen next year. We've got enough data, right? Exactly. Yeah, I am. So I'm a rambler. I, I will ramble on and on. I get it from my dad. And um, I actually developed a script where I, I put in bullet points exactly the points that I wanted to come across to patients. And I've learned to customize that based off of how the, the parent is, you know, are they an engineer or do they just want kind of, you know, high level information and no details? And that's been really helpful for me to stay on track, kind of like basically the script that, that you said, you know, I see something here that concerns me. That's part of my verbiage too. I specifically say the word concerns. Um, it makes me feel of, better that it was smart because you do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. You're like one of the smartest <laughs> human beings. Um, 
but I, I also do the plus lens trick that, you know, is pretty popular in the myopia management world. And I, I find that that more than anything that I say has been really effective in them being like, wow, I had no idea that they saw that way. And, and I like to project it out, not just the following year, but what I would estimate they would be three, four years down the line and say, you know, gosh, if this continues, this is what their vision will look like in three to four years if we don't do anything other than prescribe glasses like we've done in years past. Yeah. Yeah. Those demonstrations really mean a lot. And my wife does binocular vision and vision therapy. And uh, that's so helpful when you can demonstrate something of what the parent or the child is going through, particularly if you can make things double for them and, and demonstrate how the child is just trying to have to push to be able to see. Um, I think that's really key. You said the plus that everybody in myopia management does. You're presuming that we all do it and know what you mean. So just describe what you do and how you go about it. Yeah. So let's say that they were a minus a quarter the previous year. Then I grab a plus quarter lenses. Uh, Their new prescription is a, you know, minus one. I grab my plus ones and then say, say they're seven years old and I know that they're going to be a a aggressive progressor, then maybe I estimate that in three years, four years, they're a minus two. And that's kind of, you know, being conservative. You could also pull up some of those um, calculators, though they are, they tend to overestimate. You could look at what it projects their, their prescription to be three, four years down the line. So you take those plus lenses and you show the parent last year, this is how they saw the world and put the lenses over their eyes. This year, this is now how their vision has worsened. And this is how they see the world. Mm-hmm. If we continue to prescribe glasses like we have, you know, previously or last year, this is what their vision will look like three to four years from now. This is how their mm-hmm. world is going to change. And can you imagine seeing yeah. the world like this? Can't imagine it. Yeah. What also you can do is you can start with allowing the parent to see the 2080 line through the, and then have them close their eyes. And when they put the higher prescription, show them the 2015. So they really can't see it. That helps prove your point too. So bad. <laughs> I'm just, I don't do that. I don't do that. <laughs> but um, I, so kind of along that point, I did, I, I kind of, um, found through my own experience that it was much more um, powerful to show them outside, just have them simply step outside the exam room and look at the office. Uh, so things that are far away versus when you're in a smaller exam yeah. room, it doesn't seem as impactful because they're looking at things intermediate distance and it doesn't seem as bad yeah. as when they can look at something truly far away. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Totally. We, we venture outside the exam room a lot and that really helps helps with that as well. Um, things about myopia management that uh, that kind of suck uh, is how expensive it is. Right. Yeah, and um, like like we were discussing, you know, how you discussed previously with um, you know, absolute um, you know, the docs that are just absolutely crushing it in the myopia management, like Andrew Neukrish, he doing that subscription model. I think that that is so genius. And we've, we're doing something a little bit different where we're rolling out a, a monthly and uh, TBD on how that's going to go. But I've had some doctors when I've, you know, gone to these conferences, talk about how say that, say just for numbers sake, they're global package is $1,000. They've, I've had multiple folks tell me that they've actually changed it to 2000, but have divided it into the monthly payments. And I've found that patients are way more likely to commit to a smaller monthly fee when it's just shown as this is this amount per month versus it's a thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, cause I know that you're going to start that as well, what your experience is, it is and I'll be yeah. to, to hear about it. Yeah. We haven't announced that on the myopia podcast that we're going to a subscription oh. model of sorts, Sorry. but uh, more, <laughs> more <laughs> well, I'm announcing it. So more to come on that as well. <laughs> and we'll see, see how it goes. But 
because it is so expensive, you have to find ways to bring value. And we had a myopia podcast where we talked about having a myopia coordinator, right? And many of us, I think, just kind of allow everybody in our office to kind of be the person who talks about everything, right? Maybe it's your optician and they talk about lid scrubs, warm compresses, omega-3s. They talk about macular health issues. They talk, you know, and, and then they talk and but having somebody in your office, if you're really dedicated to this, who is the person to go to, we have that in our, uh, our vision therapy. We have somebody who's kind of in charge of that. And, you know, you have it for your glasses. And uh, once you get into generating reasonable money in the myopia space, it is worthwhile to have a myopia coordinator. And is that person who you can go and talk to? And that person can share that value so that it's not necessarily just on the doctor because we don't sell contact lens years supplies. We make a recommendation and then the team kind of closes the deal. It's important to have that sort of thing as, as we grow in our myopia management, I think as well. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah Any, totally anything agree. else at forefront of your mind about what sucks about myopia <laughs> management? I would say that those really are those really are the main things. And uh, I'm glad that we talked about it. I hate to be the person on the podcast. That's the Debbie Downer, but uh, you are, you are such a Debbie Downer, (laughs) negative Nancy, right? Well, uh, anybody who knows you knows that, that you, you tend to find the positive in things all the time. So this is a, this is a good turn of events for you. This is good. (laughs) So glad everyone could see me in a, in a (laughs) negative light. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Well, thanks for being on the podcast. It's always an honor to get to hang out with you. Um, any closing thoughts or excitements or anything? Um, so I am super duper pumped. We just purchased a Pentacam AXL and it's just Mm -hmm. going to be an absolute game changer. I feel like we have arrived. I feel like we are elite status now. (laughs) So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if you haven't currently so been doing it, you know, the, the great thing about this is it changes your myopia, your scleral, your, you know, all the different aspects of your practice. You've now got uh, axial length, which really can change things if you weren't doing that before. Uh, so yeah, it is, yeah, it is we, an excitement in many ways, I'm sure for you. We, we had a um, biometry before and I'm so thankful uh-huh. that we did because it, it does, it's a game changer with your yeah. management of myopia management, but I'm, I'm stoked for the scleral topography side of things and just being able to look at the posterior cornea. Oh gosh, yeah. I don't have to send out for that anymore for monitoring my keratoconic patients. For yeah. Processing. Yeah. So well, very so cool. cool. Well, thank you for being on the podcast. It's an honor to get to speak with you and thank you for joining us for this episode of the myopia podcast. Please make sure to like, and subscribe. We'll see you again next time on the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.